Hi guys, and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. Today's case actually caught my eye when I was researching the Eurydice Dixon case. And if you haven't seen that video, I did that a few videos back and I just kept seeing this name pop up. Aya Masarwe loved Australia. She loved visiting new places, meeting new people, having new experiences. She knew how to take care of herself, how to be safe. That's why she would always call someone when she was walking home by herself. And she did that night. She called her sister as she walked home until her phone dropped and all her sister heard were her screams. Let's talk about the horrific case of Aya Masarwe. Aya was born in the year 1997 in Baka al-Garbiye, which was a predominantly Arab city in the Haifa district in northern Israel, and she was born to a Palestinian Muslim family. Her parents were Saeed and Kitam, and she had three sisters. Their names were Noor, Ruba, and Lena. Aya was really positive, she was friendly, and she loved to have fun, and she was a very loving girl, especially to her family. She was a kind sister, a good daughter, and her family, her sisters, were really proud of the woman she had become. Aya liked to explore and discover new things. She liked to see new places, meet new people. I believe her mother, Kitam, and her sister, Ruba, lived in Israel, but her father, he ran a business in China, and I believe her sister, Noor, joined him in China, and she lived there too. Aya was extremely smart. She could speak three languages, Hebrew, Arabic, and Mandarin. And after she graduated al Qasimi school in 2006, she moved to China to live with her father and her sister Noor to study Chinese and English at the Shanghai University. Like I said, Aya loved to explore, loved to travel. So when she was 21, she decided to go on a study abroad trip to Australia. Melbourne in particular, where she would study at La Trobe, university for one year and practice her English. She arrived in Melbourne sometime mid-2018 and she went to the Bandura campus of La Trobe University and she also lived in an apartment near the campus. A lot of international students or even students from like the country or other states come down to Melbourne to study. So a lot of the university campuses have housing or they buy off like apartment buildings or build apartment buildings or housing or lodging near the campuses so that these students can have a place to live near uni. And Aya did live in one of these buildings. It was like a little apartment building, I believe run by the school. And um, yeah, it was close to the, close to the campus. Bandura is about a 40 minute drive from Melbourne CBD or about an hour if you take public transport. In six months of living in Melbourne, Aya really lived. She really explored the state. She went hiking in the Grampians. She tried Vegemite. She went on multiple road trips. She visited the Shrine of Remembrance. And I believe she even went tandem skydiving over the Great Ocean Road. When Aya finished skydiving, she posted on Instagram that it was the best decision she ever made. Her family was extremely proud of their ambitious daughter and they believed Australia to be a really safe place and they believed Aya to be a smart and responsible girl, which she was. Aya kept in touch with her family in Israel, her mother and her sister, and then she also kept in touch with her father and her other sister in China. She spoke to them almost daily and they had plans to come to visit Aya in Australia one day. Aya made friends easily and she would socialize with these students from her English course. And she even had a WhatsApp group chat going on with them. On 15th January, 2019, it was Tuesday evening and Aya made plans with friends to attend an event in the city called Let's Talk in English. And this was an event to be held at Flagstaff Gardens in Melbourne CBD, which is basically a big park in the city near like the main CBD near all the stations. It's a pretty busy area. This event was part of a meetup group, which encouraged people new to Melbourne to come and talk in English. A photo of Aya was taken at 7.56 p.m. that night at the event, and it shows Aya in this photo. She's standing there smiling. She's wearing a pink t-shirt, with the word merci written on the front. 
After the event, Aya and her friends traveled to the Comic Lounge in North Melbourne to attend a comedy show. After the show ended, one of Aya's friends dropped her off at a tram stop in Burke Street, which is in Melbourne's CBD, and Aya caught the 1050 tram home. Like I said, it takes about an hour to get back to that area with public transport. So Aya got off at the Plenty Road tram stop near Main Drive in Bandura at about 12.05 a.m. This tram stop was basically directly across the street of the street that would lead her to her apartment. So she crossed the street, entered Main Drive, and walked along Main Drive next to the Polaris Shopping Center. At this point, Aya's apartment building is still a fair while away. It's about 1.4 kilometers or a half a mile away, so about a 20 minute walk. Now, Aya had always felt a bit weird about this walk, always a little bit scared. So every time she would walk home from the tram stop, she would give one of her sisters a call. So she calls her sister Ruba in Israel, and in Australia, it's about 12, 10 a.m., so early Wednesday morning, late Tuesday night, and it would have been about 4 p.m. Tuesday back in Israel. So her sister Ruba answers and Aya says to her, oh, I'm surprised I didn't expect you to pick up. As Aya and her sister began to chat, almost immediately, her sister began to hear the sounds of Aya screaming. She hears her say, you piece of shit in Arabic. Ruba then hears a noise like something being hit or banged four times. Ruba stayed on the phone and listened, but then all she could hear were the sounds of cars driving by and Aya did not get back on the phone and she had no idea what happened to her sister. Ruba began freaking out. So she then calls her sister Noor in China and then they both attempted to call Aya and send her several text messages. But Aya responded to nothing. They then decided to report what had happened to the Australian police. By that time, it was around 7 a.m. in Melbourne. Coincidentally, around the same time, Tradesmen walking on Main Drive saw the body of a young woman behind some bushes. It was Aya. Her body was found only 50 meters away from the tram stop and about one kilometer away from her apartment. Aya had sustained significant head injuries and there were multiple burn marks on her body. Aya was an international student. Her horrific murder caused an outrage, not only in Melbourne, but around the world. Detectives on the case believed that Aya was likely stalked before she was attacked and killed, but they did believe that it was a random and opportunistic attack. At first, police did not say whether Aya had been sexually assaulted, and Detective Stamper stated I don't want to go into specifics out of respect for the family. And also, it's early in the investigation. This was an absolutely horrendous, horrific attack inflicted on a completely innocent young woman who was a visitor to our city. At this time, it had only been seven months since Eurydice Dixon was attacked and killed in Princess Park by a man who stalked her on her way home. If you haven't heard about that case, I will leave it linked below in the description, but that's another horrific case that took place seven months before Aya was killed. The people of Melbourne were already pissed and angry from that case. Now they were horrified. Aya's family was just shocked that she was even attacked in Australia. They believed Australia to be a safe place. They didn't think something like this was going to happen here. Lots of Melburnians left flowers and messages at the place where Aya was found. And one of the messages said, everyone has the right to get home safely. Police asked anyone who was in the vicinity that night, who could have been driving past, who may have had dash cam footage, to just contact Crime Stoppers with any information. At the scene, police did find some evidence. They found a black hat that had 1986 written on the front and a cotton-on brand black and gray t-shirt. 
And they also found a can of WD-40 and a metal pole. Now, these were suspected by the police to have been left behind by the killer. So they were collected and they were sent in for analysis. Police then began combing through CCTV footage from around that area. And they also spoke to registered sex offenders within that area. After they did this, two days later, they then released the images of the clothing that was found in the area, the black t-shirt and the hat, and they let the public know that they believed that this was left behind by the killer. And, you know, when I was reading about this, I thought, okay, it's going to be someone from the public who, you know, recognizes these images. But no, it was a local leading constable who had seen the clothing and the hat and it triggered a memory in him. This officer remembered a man who was wearing the exact same clothing four days earlier. The man he saw wearing this clothing was 21-year-old Cody Herman. Within an hour of seeing these images, the senior constable together with a detective found Cody Herman and arrested him. When they asked Cody about Aya, his response was, I didn't kill no one. The next day on Saturday, 19th, January, 2019, Cody was arrested and charged for and murder. Cody at the time was unemployed and described himself as a rapper, but Cody's life was not a good life. He came from his own chaotic rhythm. He was homeless and unemployed, and when his fortnightly Centrelink payments came through, which is welfare, he would buy methamphetamine and cannabis and share it with all his friends. He survived on a diet of croissants and chocolate milk. And that sounds good, but no, he was having the croissants from like the grocery store, you know, the cheap ones. He slept wherever, he shoplifted whatever he needed, including the barbecue lighter that he would light his cigarettes with and what he used to inflict horrific injuries on Aya's body. After his arrest, police asked Cody what he was thinking during his brutal attack on Aya. And he said, I don't really know. I wasn't really thinking at all. Police asked him, were you angry? Were you angry at her? You know, is that why you attacked her? And he said, I think I was angry at life in general, how everyone looked at me and treated me. I had nothing. I could achieve nothing. Even my friends made fun of me. Cody's mother was Aboriginal and his father was of German descent. He was disconnected from his culture and socially isolated. And his early years were marked by poverty, chaos, and dysfunction. Child protection services came into his life when he was just six months old because a drunken adult who was in his presence left a bottle of alcohol around and Cody had drank from it. Now, I was like, how does a six month old drink from something like that? A six month old cannot you know, lift up anything. So I'm like, how did that happen? But I think there's more to it. I mean, you guys who have babies would know that a six month old is not going to be able to lift a bottle of alcohol unless the alcohol was put into a cup or a baby cup. You know what I mean? Like, it's just it's really, really sad. When he was one year old, he was abandoned by his mom who suffered from drug and alcohol problems. And if that's not enough, at one and a half, he contracted scabies. And scabies is a parasitic infection caused by tiny mites that burrow into the skin and lay eggs, causing intense itching and a rash. Like, you know, he's a child at the end of the day. He, he was one and a half. Just to think about a poor baby It's just sad that some kids are placed in situations like that. And that was Cody's upbringing. So when he was one and a half, he was treated in hospital for scabies. But then by the time he was three, just a year and a half later, Child Protection Services got multiple tips about drug and alcohol abuse in the home, family violence and neglect. 
Cody had rotten teeth and skin issues at just three years old. Fortunately, Cody, together with his sister, were eventually adopted out. But by the time he started school, Cody had severe behavioral issues. When he was in foster care, his biological mother would fail to show up to visits, or when she did visit, she would arrive drunk, and he had no contact with his father while he was in foster care. This obviously affected Cody. I mean, he hurt other children, and he had difficulty forming friendships. That night, when Aya was at the comedy show, Cody was in the Polaris shopping center, just loitering around. He left the shopping center at 12.07 a.m. just two minutes after Aya got off the tram. It is believed that as he exited the Polaris shopping center, somewhere along his walk he picks up a metal pipe and then he begins walking on Main Drive, the same road that Aya was walking on. And from what I gather, I believe Aya was walking from the Main Road down Main Drive this way and he was walking up Main Road this way and Who knows if he saw her for a while, but as he crossed paths with Aya, he struck her over the head with the metal pipe. Aya then drops her phone while she was on the call with her sister Ruba. It is believed Cody then dragged Aya into the bushes between the road and the car park. And it is believed that when he was doing this, Aya was perhaps already unconscious and never regained consciousness. Cody then removed some of Aya's clothing and assaulted her. And he then struck her over the head with the metal pipe nine times. It is believed Cody then sprayed Aya with WD-40 and then used his barbecue lighter to try and set fire to Aya's clothing. There were multiple burn marks found all over her body. A pathologist was unable to determine whether Aya was still alive when Cody was attempting to set fire to her body and her clothes. The forensic report detailed that Aya suffered extensive head injuries. I mean, she was hit with so much force with this metal pipe that it had fractured multiple bones on her skull and her face. There were tears in her brain tissue and her neck also suffered extensive injuries which she either got from him hitting her with the metal pole with such force or when he was dragging her and her head and neck were left unsupported i mean she died from her severe head injuries and skull fractures after cody finished this brutal attack on aya He ran away at 12.27 a.m., taking Aya's bag and other evidence with him. However, as he was running away, he leaves a trail of evidence behind him. CCTV footage captures him climbing over this nature reserve nearby, and his black hat got stuck on the fence, so he left it behind. And he got rid of his t-shirt, which had Aya's blood all over it, so he took it off and he threw it. And then he also threw that metal pole he used on Aya to beat her with it. And he also got rid of that WD-40 spray can, which I believe from the trail wasn't actually all that far apart. So police were obviously able to piece it together that this was all used in Aya's attack. One interesting piece of information I found was that although Cody, it was not determined that he knew Aya, but he had attempted to gain access into her apartment building six weeks before her murder. And he tried to do this twice. In December, 2018, he tried to gain access to this, to her apartment building. And he was telling other students that were exiting the building that he had lost his key. And then a few days later, he was seen standing around on the grass outside the apartment building, kind of like waiting to see if he could get in some way. He had a few Facebook pages and one of them with his alias rapper name, MC Codes, he posted lyrics about suicide and about demons in his mind. On 8th January 2019, on his other Facebook page called Cody Rex, he posted, International Girl of Mystery, you knows who you are. And that's weird, right? Given that Aya had only been in Melbourne for six months 
months. He had tried to access her apartment building twice in the six months that she had been living there. But despite these strange encounters, I guess you can call it, police didn't feel that the two were connected. And I mean, this could be true because there were other international students who lived in that apartment building. I mean, how do we know he was trying to get access to Aya alone? It would have been hard to solidify that he was there for Aya without kind of his own confirmation or if Aya would have said something about some guy stalking her, you know? Despite Cody telling police that he didn't kill anyone, he pled guilty in court, so no trial took place. But a plea hearing took place, and during this hearing, the details of Aya's attack were outlined, but the harsher details were redacted to just prevent causing further emotional distress and harm on Aya's family. Aya's family was not at the plea hearing. They lived overseas, but, you know, they were obviously going to get the court notes. So all of the gruesome details were redacted. And if you don't know, the purpose of a plea hearing is basically for the prosecution and the defense to argue factors leading to the eventual sentence that would be imposed. It was the defense's task to explain why Cody Herman, a young man with no prior convictions or history of real violence, would viciously bash a young woman, rape and murder her, and then set her body on fire. His defense lawyer stated, there is not an explanation I can give you that is going to get us from start to finish. Cody had been diagnosed with drug-induced psychosis as well as a severe personality disorder and the judge stated that his life was in profound chaos and despair before the murder. She stated that his already fragile mental state had begun to break down entirely. During the hearing, Cody just seemed to not be with it. He occasionally looked down or he was staring off into the distance. He bit his lips, stroked his chin. He seemed to just be in a completely different world. A forensic psychiatrist who interviewed Cody stated that the profound psychological impact of the neglect he faced early on in life completely stunted his brain development. He had no positive relationships with men, including his father. At one point, Cody was asked about fathers and he stated, I've seen them portrayed in movies, but I'm not really sure what they do. And then to further kind of make his life, you know, worse, his mother, his biological mother died when he was a teenager. And I've talked about this in other cases, but in early childhood needs, the brain development that takes place up until a child is five years old is critical in helping or in developing any normal sense of attachment and trust in the world. It really plays a part in shaping a person. And even though Cody was placed in a foster home before the age of four, a lot of the damage had already been done. His personality disorder seriously affected his ability to make decisions and together with other factors was the underlying reason for the murder. They said it was an eruption of suppressed rage that was building for years. It erupted for some unknown reason that night on this innocent woman with no known trigger. The court stated, this is the manifestation of male rage towards a female. Now, if you've watched my video on Eurydice Dixon, this case is very, very, very similar, right? A man with mental disorders attacks a random woman on the street while she's walking home. But in this case, the prosecution sought a life sentence, but did not with the perpetrator in the Eurydice case, James Todd, who was a white man. Cody is Aboriginal, which as the psychiatrist pointed out and made note of, 
He stated, it does not make him intrinsically less responsible for his crime and deserving of a more lenient sentence, but it often indicates deprivation and disadvantage and his background of profound trauma, the instability of his identity and sense of futility could be seen as a mitigating factor in sentencing. Now, remember the whole point of the plea hearing was to figure out what sentence this perpetrator just deserves, right? So basically what they were saying is that just because he's Aboriginal doesn't mean that he deserves a lesser sentence, but it was something to be noted, right? Because the cases were so similar and one was thought, well, one perpetrator was thought, you know, to be deserving of a life sentence and the other not, but the other being James Todd, the Eurydice Dixon perpetrator, his mannerisms or his reasonings were far more serious, right? The offense was far more serious given the sexual sadism and stalking of Eurydice prior to the murder. The prosecution stated that Cody seemed perplexed and disconnected after his arrest and he showed a curious detachment. And even though there was some evidence of remorse, it was very muted and that his overall emotional range was just very muted. Days before he attacked Aya, Cody's friend said that he found Cody on the floor in his bedroom and Cody had said to him, bro, I just had like five psychosis. I saw a murder in my head. Cody also wrote a letter to Aya's family, which read as follows. Your daughter didn't deserve such a terrible and tragic thing to happen to her. I don't expect any forgiveness because I will never be able to forgive myself and I will be trying to make amends for the rest of my life. Don't give in to hate like I did. Love. Goodbye. During the trial, the prosecutor paused for several minutes before he could even read out the family's victim impact statements. And Kitam, Aya's mother, says she still watches and reads her daughter's text messages just to hear her voice. She stated, you cannot imagine what happened to me after her death. She was my daughter and friend. I was in touch with her every day. She used to tell me always, I miss you so much, mom. When I see you again, I will hug and kiss you. I am a mother whose heart has been squeezed in pain day after day. Her sister, Nora, also wrote a statement which read, A lot of time I find myself lost, lost in the crowds, or sometimes stuck, stuck in the past. Now I live with fear. At the sentencing, which took place in October 2019, the judge took into account Cody's age, his medical condition, and the fact that he pled guilty at the earliest, so as to avoid putting the family through any further trauma. She stated that although Cody was a drug user, there was no evidence to prove that he was intoxicated that night, that he had a clear intention of harming Aya because he was walking around with that metal pole prior to bumping into Aya, that he either had the can of WD-40 with him or he went looking around for it to inflict further injury on Aya. And Cody doesn't remember or explain how he got to be in possession of this can of WD-40 or the metal pole, in fact. The judge went on to say that women should be free to walk the streets without being in fear of being violently attacked by a stranger. That Aya was physically small, she was unsuspecting, she was alone, she had no opportunity to defend herself. The judge also did determine that Cody did have a fair chance of rehabilitation with appropriate support and supervision, that he had a chance to better his life. His lawyer told the court that life in jail was better than life on the streets. Cody told investigators that since his arrest, he could only think of things that he had gained. He said, I've gained a safe place to sleep. I get fed three times a day. I have a shower. And I've also gained a sense of hope that maybe one day if I behave myself in custody, I might get to go to a prison that has good programs. On 29th October 2019, Cody was sentenced to 36 years in prison with a non-parole period of 30 years for the rape and murder 
of Aya Masarwe. This is just such a sad and tragic case. I mean, not to defend Cody, but his life was just shit. I know there are a lot of people who have tough lives and they don't commit rape and murder, right? But the health and welfare of certain people, like the members of the Aboriginal community, are not really looked at here in Australia. I felt like we needed to talk about his background, what led him to this crime, because I don't feel like people are just born with hate. Have you ever seen a baby, a newborn? It doesn't start there. Their circumstances, their life, their surroundings shape them. And I always think about that. I always think about, you know, it's they. we all start as a baby and we're so innocent and then shit just happens. But at the same time, I feel like our country has enough money to look out for people's safety a little bit more. Like maybe I'm wrong, but I just feel like we do. Simple things, you know, like security guard stations at university campuses or, you know, at least near dorms up until midnight at least. A lot of uni students study on campus late into the night. And I know Aya wasn't studying. She was returning home from an event and no one can stop a grown adult from going out, guys. But you know how sometimes if there's a curfew, like in America, I know dorms have curfews. Or if you know that security is finishing up at, say, you know, 1 a.m., for example, I feel like most students would probably aim to be home before that because they would know that there's someone there looking out for them or someone to at least witness something. I was sort of doing that by phoning her sister, right? Like making sure that someone was kind of with her on her walk home. And in this situation, unfortunately, nothing could have been done because it just happened so quickly. But usually if, you know, her sister was like, oh my God, something happened to my sister. She could have called the police immediately, could have sort of been actioned a bit quicker, but you know, you don't expect your sister to be killed while you're on the phone with them. I haven't caught a train in a really long time, but I know that in the last few years, there have been protective service officers that patrol either major train stations or maybe even all train stations. And like, this is to ensure everyone's safety, right? And isn't this such a great thing for people catching trains by themselves or during non-peak hours? I mean, how many times have you been harassed on a train? It happens everywhere, right? And I feel like this is so great because it would prevent certain offenders from even thinking about doing something. But at the end of the day, this case is about a beautiful young woman's life being taken away by someone who should have received help at an early age. This was another preventable crime. I mean, we should all be able to freaking get home safely. What do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. And I will see you in next week's video. Besitos. Bye.